it for at any time or unincluded or unwelcome for any reason or anything weird is going on or somebody says something crappy, just find somebody in a blue shirt uh, and they will definitely help you out. If you can't find someone in a blue shirt, the front desk can help you. Um, uh, also, we have thumb drives over across the street at Jillian's with betas of all the cool things that we heard about this morning. So that's a cool thing to check out later if you want to. Uh, our next speaker is the co-host of the Unprofessional podcast um, and also the designer behind Vesper. So please give a hand to Dave Whiskus. Hello. Good uh, afternoon. It's afternoon now, or morning, whichever, depending on where you're from. This is a new clicker to me, so if I get this wrong, bear with me. How's everybody doing today? Good? Not a lot of enthusiasm so far. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to dial up the enthusiasm just a little bit. I'm going to get a video of you guys. Andre right now. I'm going to take a video. What I want to do, this is for my mom. Uh, I want you guys to, to clap and applaud and be excited as if this thing ended and it went really, really well. <laughs> Perfect. Now I want you to boo me. One of those I'm going to send to my mom, and the other one's just for me. <laughs> we'll make sure that's vibrating the whole time. All right. So now that we're a little bit more excited, let's talk about some stuff. So the, the name of this is uh, How to Make a Vesper. And that's kind, of, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. What I'm really going to talk about is people. And what people mean to software, and what people mean to me. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell some stories. And it's not going to be technical. I'm not going to tell you anything about Photoshop. Um, my job title is designer, and, and it would be really easy to do uh, the sort of here's how you design things version of a talk. But what I'd rather talk about is people, not, not necessarily places. And, and not people like fake people or slightly less creepy fake people or people taking selfies. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm Dave. I'm a designer at Q Branch. I work on an app called Vesper. I live in New York City. I have a dog, Pixel. And in addition to designing things and being on podcasts, sometimes I go to conferences and I get to play Rockstar. And sometimes I uh, do things on Twitter like IRL emoji, which is pretty much exactly what you think it is. Recently, I went to Ireland for a conference. And on my way in, the, the customs guy does his usual, you know, what are you here for, business or pleasure? I thought about it for a second. Well, I guess, I guess business. And he says, well, what are you doing here? So it's a, it's a conference. So he writes conference on the thing. And he asks, what kind of conference? I said, well, it's a conference for people who make iPhone apps. He's like, okay. How do you get into that? <laughs> thought about it for a second. I'm like, well, I just... I kind of started doing it, I guess. I, I, I met some people and, and, like, well, for you, if you want to get into this, like, you can just go to developer.apple.com and you can have the same tools that I have. And he goes, really, it's that easy? And I said, yeah, I mean, you can get started like anybody can. He goes, oh, I know what I'm doing tonight. And I thought, wow, what a, what, if this is his introduction into making software, what a great moment. What a, what a great thing that he's, he's going home that night to look up the developer tools and see if he can get started making his own iPhone app. And I kind of hope to see him at the next conference. At some point, I'm going to tell this story, and I hope he comes up, after me, uh, up, up to me after the talk and says, like, I was that customs guy. But I, it got me thinking about what, how did I get into this? I mean, it's not like I went to some fancy school for design. There, there is no, or was no, iOS app designer school. I, I went to high school. 
I dropped out. When I was, when I was 16, I was such a terrible student that my, my high school guidance counselor suggested that I drop out. So I took his advice. I didn't go to college. That's not a missing picture. That's just I didn't go to college. I, I, instead of college or university or whatever, I just stayed at home and I played with computers instead. That was kind of more my thing. And for a long time, I was really into Linux. Um, the problem with Linux, though, was that I spent all of my time working on the computer. And I wasn't really thinking about the computer as a tool to do another job. And then a few years later, I discovered my first Mac. It was a 12-inch PowerBook. It changed my life. Suddenly, I was spending all of my time reading things like Mac Rumors and Daring Fireball in Net Newswire, of course. And I, I, got, I got the itch to make something. I'd been, I'd been stealing Photoshop since I was about 15, so I figured I, I could draw pictures. I could find somebody to, to write the software. So I started a, a little thing called Coat Hanger, probably the worst name for a startup ever. It was, uh, it was Twitter for fashion, Twitter for your pants how we pitched it. You can probably guess why it didn't do so well. But it was, it was like a microblog thing where you take a picture of what you were wearing that day and you'd post it and other people could comment on your outfit and, and tell you like, oh, that looks great on you or you look fat, don't do that again. Mostly the, the former, thankfully. But it was, just wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't very compelling. We were maybe a few years ahead of our time and I think if we were to pitch that today, we might get funding. But it was a, at first it was just a website. There was no app. And uh, I, was, I was at a conference, the first 360i dev, accidentally. I was in town at the same time as the conference in, in San Jose. And a mutual friend had sent an email to me and Brent Simmons saying, hey, you guys are both in town. You guys should meet. You guys should have a drink. And so I did. I, I went to, to Brent and had a drink and met some people. He introduced me to some of the people that were at the conference with him. And the thing that I noticed about all these people is how happy they seemed. They seemed so excited just to be there, to be doing what they were doing. And I'd never, I'd never really seen anything like that before. I'd never seen people so content with their job. And I thought, well, this, I need to do this. This should be my job. I need to get into this world. And I just kind of kept hanging out with Brent. But while I was there, I, I met a guy. And I asked him, like, well, I'm doing this thing, this, this social network for clothing sort of deal. And we, we could use an app. You make apps, like, ballpark it. Like how, much, like, how much of a cost am I looking at to get an app made? And at the time, I didn't know any better, something like a couple grand. And he responds, we can't even start this conversation for under $30,000. I'm like, oh, well then. And he goes, here's my advice. Go buy a book on iPhone development. And just learn how to do it. So I went home from the conference and I told the guy that I started this thing with, hey, we need, to, we need an iPhone app and it's going to be really expensive. We're just going to have to make one ourselves. Let's go buy a book. So we bought a book and he learned to code and I kept doing Photoshop-y things. And almost to the day, one year later, the guy who gave me that advice acquired our company. The app itself was... Not exactly my best work. But at the time, it, it, it felt like something. It was pretty terrible, but it got less terrible over time. And eventually, it, we started making other things. We started making apps for other people, for their services. And that, that took us down this path of, of kind of forgetting this. And we forgot about the, the social network thing, because what we really liked doing was making iPhone apps. And the idea of being able to do that as a job, that was pretty cool. And so when we got acquired, that was the moment where we went from being hobbyists to being people who make apps, people who like, like professionals. And so now, a few years later, the things that I've done, I mean, I've done some things I can talk about. I've done some things that I, I, I can't talk about. But before I knew it, I, I had my hands on all kinds of stuff. About a year and some change ago, I found myself looking for a new project. And my friend, Justin Williams, there's a stuffed unicorn there. He mentioned an idea that John Gruber had pitched to him for a to-do list app. And I was looking for a project. He was looking for a project. And it was, uh, hey, if we did this, it would be a good way to get maybe a little bit of attention. It's not a, not a tough project to pull off. Should we do this? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? 
Uh, sadly, Justin wound up being busy with real work, and we never got around to doing anything more than some Photoshop documents. But then, not long after that, I was, I was talking to Brent Simmons and John Gruber about the idea of doing a side project together. And I said, well, I, I have this, like some Photoshop work from the thing that we were working on. We looked at it and it was, well, that's, that's a start, but we don't really want to make a to-do list app. And we started talking through, uh, our, like our first real iteration session of, of, well, maybe if we did things this way, or maybe we could do things this way. And we just threw the idea out and we started building it back up from the ground. And we realized that the idea itself was good, but it shouldn't be to-do so much as it is just getting ideas down on paper, so to speak. And this was at the, uh, the Singleton Conference, the very uh, handsome guy English. And if not for not just meeting Brent and being introduced to the, the world of iOS people, but meeting people along the way, meeting my friend Guy who invites me to, the, to come to this conference and having this chance meeting where we're sitting down to talk about a side project that ended up becoming our main project and has become my day job, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have the opportunity to do these things. And the earliest versions of, of Vesper, what became Vesper, look very, very different from what it looks like today. But we talked about to do versus what we really wanted to accomplish and at the end of the conversation we we sort of deconstructed the thing and built it back up. The first real design meeting. Here's the bad version. We like to talk about spitballs. We do this thing where if there's an idea that's not a good idea or not yet a good idea, we try to focus on the yet part. Here's the bad version. What happens when you say here's the bad version is you take all the steam out of somebody wanting to point out what's wrong with the idea. Hey guys, spitball. What if we did this? And sometimes people like us, it's really easy to go, well, yeah, but, and here are all the problems with your idea. But when you say, here's the bad version, just a spitball, just throwing it out there, you're not inviting people to criticize, you're inviting people to, instead of saying, yeah, but, say yes, and. Like, yeah, and maybe we can do things this way, or maybe we can twist it this way, make it a little bit better. And so instead of criticizing each other, we end up in a place where it's, it's collaborative. And when we look at Vesper, the process of, of making this thing. Let's see if my slide's going to work. There we go. You start a conversation with here's the bad version. You give yourself license to fail. And you give your teammates license to give you honest feedback. And an idea is a seed. You plant the seeds and some will sprout. Others never do. And sometimes the best stuff starts with a bad idea. For an example of bad ideas, Take a look at a slide that takes a full minute to get through. We're really big on animations. These are iterations of, of what the app looked like in its development stages. A little different from what it turned out to be. So it's really easy to say things like great artists steal, which is us stealing that from Steve Jobs who stole it from Picasso or whoever. In the early days, a lot of our time was spent doing two things. We were working on Vesper and we were playing letterpress. Probably sometimes playing letterpress more than working on Vesper. And what we learned pretty quickly is that great artists steal from Lauren Richter. Because at the time, we, we were looking at letterpress and we're thinking, there's something here. There's something about this, this style of, of UI. It's so stripped down. Like the game itself, you could almost say, had no real UI, but it had so much character. You could, it didn't feel stripped down. It just felt pleasant. It felt basic, but in a good way. It wasn't trying too hard to impress you, and the gameplay itself is what stood out. So amazingly clean. It's just a simple, minimalist style kind of jumped out at us. Now, this can work, this can work in some cases, works really well for a game, but for a utility app like what we were working on, usually the UI is pretty straightforward visually. There's not a lot of room for flourish. 
But we decided to kind of go nuts and see if we could pull it off. We studied the colors, we studied the shapes, the animations, uh, hoping to find the right recipe for how these elements could get pulled together. One of the things that we stared at a lot were watches. It's really easy in the software business to get all of your inspiration from other software. And the thing that it feels like we miss when we do that is the human component. Because these are things we kind of think in ones and zeros and colors and shapes and how the software moves and how it looks and how it behaves and is there a bug. And it's so easy to forget that there's a human being on the other side of that glass. So when we take a look at something physical, a watch or a car, it's not just sort of a hand wavy designer thing to say, I'm looking at design inspiration from these well-made things. It's about a watch is something that you wear. It physically touches your body and has a, a weight to it. There's a gravity there that software, as we think about it, doesn't. But the truth is that software goes on a phone that sits in your pocket. That's, that's glass that a human finger is going to touch, or an elbow or a sausage or something. These are, it, it's a real world thing. So we took a look at, at watches, one, because of the, the physical connection, two, because they have to be simple. There's only so much room on the face of a watch to put stuff. And in the world of watches, they're not called features, they're called complications. And that's a pretty good lesson to learn. It's a concern about how much crap are you putting on their equivalent of a screen. Plus we just kind of like watches. There's a personal connection that you have with a watch. Maybe it's your grandfather's pocket watch was handed down through a series of hilarious events before you got it. Maybe it's something your dad bought or somebody, it was a gift from your wife or your husband. It carries a sentimental value that we never think about when it comes to software. And I don't mean that software should last forever because it's, it's not. What we do is not art, it's fashion, more so than, than a watch. But I, what I mean is that there's still a person. There's still a person with their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own set of emotions, and their own good days and bad days. They're going to be using this thing. And it's so much better, it can be so much better, if you're thinking about the people rather than just the thing you're making. The picture on the screen right now, this is a Rolex ad from the 1960s. And there's just so much happening in this photo. There's so much to be said about that time, that place in America, and, and what a watch meant to somebody then, and what it still means now. And there's gender politics, and there's social politics, and there's such a, there's a rich story being told in one photograph from the, the tilt of his hand, the cuff. You can tell he's in a, a certain type of social situation right now with the glass. This is casual but dressy, so maybe he's at a ball or a black tie event. And you can see very clearly no mistake, he's holding that glass with his left hand. And you can see there's no ring on his finger. But the other hand reaching toward is tilted where you can't see if there's a ring. And there's just so much happening in this picture. There's so much thought that went into this. And this is just the ad for the watch. This says nothing about the thought or the care that went into making a thing that is supposed to make the, the guy who was looking at this ad in the 1960s want to buy this watch. We can. There's a whole separate thing about whether that's good or bad, but it's a story. They knew what they were making. As an ad, the product was very clearly made for its audience. The watch was clearly made for its audience, and it didn't want or need for everybody to like it. So we thought about our audience. Who are we making Vesper for? Well, ourselves, really, picky, attention-focused people who value nuance over flash. And that's not everybody. We, we're, we make Vesper for the kind of person who's going to spend years looking for just the right pen in a world where nobody uses a pen anymore. That's kind of how we approached what we made. My favorite example of this was uh, John, his obsession with the color orange. Because the shade of blue, he's like, yeah, I don't care. But we use orange in the app for, for the autocomplete suggestion bubble. And technically, like thematically, the, the orange just means helpful. 
it's a different color from the blue and it contrasts with the blue and that's a good thing. But really it's, it's, it's just there for the contrast. But John really hated the shade of orange I picked. And you can kind of see it in the slides here. Mine's on the left and it's a little bit more citrusy, I guess is the way to describe it. But the difference between this shade of orange and that shade of orange, it's not the sort of thing that any one person would reasonably look at and go, oh, you, you picked that orange? You're ridiculous, why would you ever think that's okay? But I think those were his exact words. And he got a little obsessive. His, his actual picture of his actual field notes where he was going through looking at different watch companies and the shades of orange they use on their faces and looking at the dials on things like a BMW and obsessing over, like taking photographs and going into Photoshop and pulling out the color codes and comparing and contrasting. This was days he spent, I think maybe even weeks he spent doing this. This guy's got problems. But in the end, we went from the top one to the bottom one. And it is better. It's better in a way that's, that's even kind of hard to explain. It just feels better. It feels less gross. It feels more alive. It feels more happy. Uh, Dutch people love it. Vesper is an app with a clear conscience. It knows what it wants to be and it's not going to be distracted trying to be something that it's not. We get asked about markdown support a lot or rich text formatting. And those are perfectly valid ideas, it's just not Vesper. John likes to say that it supports markdown just fine, it doesn't render it. Vesper is about simplicity. You get in, you capture your idea, you get out. You can browse through your ideas, start connecting them, but that's, that's pretty much it. We're not trying to do anything fancier than that. We're making a thing for a very specific type of person. Like the watches, for example, when I do wear a watch, my watch, my regular wear watch, has no second hand. Hour and minute, that's all I get. Because I don't, I don't need to know the exact second. That's not how I think about time. This might be why I'm late to everything. That's why the first settings we ever introduced to the app were for typography. Not for the fancy sorts of things that an app would normally give you access to, like passcode locking or, or any of these things. Just the things that we thought people should care about. That we thought people would care about. The type of person who would understand what it is we're doing and, and grab onto it. At the end of the day, shipping is a feature. You have to make decisions about what goes into the app, what doesn't go into the app. And uh, sometimes you have to ship without a very obvious feature. And sometimes you have to spend months and months and months building that feature. And uh, if you're really lucky, on the day you give a talk, Apple releases something called CloudKit. And you have to answer a bunch of questions about whether or not you should have built your own syncing system. So you can all look forward to Brent's talk right after mine. So I think about that question guy asking, how did I get into this? And there's, there's a lot to it, but really it comes down to people. Like mine's not a, a typical story. And I wouldn't be here now if not for the people. I wouldn't make the things that I make without the people. So it's important to me to, and not just in, in sort of a, 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 a pithy or glib kind of way, honor that. Acknowledge that without human connections, I wouldn't be here. Therefore, the things I make should encourage and reward human connections, acknowledge human connections. It's why in our marketing materials, there's things like a picture of my dog. It's to remind people that the people who make this app are human beings. It's not just software you're getting. You're getting a set of people's thoughts and opinions about software. It's why we include on the App Store a picture of John's son, Jonas. People are the most important part of this. The people I work with are my friends. The people I meet at conferences. The people I I travel the I get to travel the world and do things like this and shake hands with you guys. This is this, this is the coolest part of my job. I wouldn't want to do this if I were all by myself. 
I don't mean like if I were a one-man shop, but if I were just make things and put them out and never get to meet you guys, never get to meet people who use the software, think about them, there'd be no incentive for me to do this job. So it's all about the people. It's all about humans. And I am pretty much exactly on time for once. So my name is Dave Wiskus. I have a Twitter account. Thank you. Somebody going to come take my microphone or something? I'm just going to stand here for a minute. <laughs> Let's make it weird. Uh, I don't, what I'd rather do instead of a QA, 